My uncle came down for a solid nine days and we got a lot of stuff done with this plane. Not just um, big tasks, we got a lot of big tasks done, but the, we got a lot of really complicated sort of two-man tasks that were really eating at me. One of which was the cowlings, which is one of the things I'm going to talk about in this video. It's actually the primary thing I want to talk about. This was uh, probably one of the most frustrating tasks that I've done on this plane so far. I mean, I honestly can't remember some of the other frustrating tasks, but uh, of frustrating tasks on this plane, this definitely ranks pretty high. Um, very challenging piece and uh, it took us at least three four days two people three four days to get it done and there's still some things I would have done differently had I had a chance to you know hit the reset button and do it over again so um, there are a few other things in the plane that um, I've done I guess I'll touch up on them here like uh, I've got some like, some stuff done with the panel we worked on the windshield and flapper ons and uh, doors are finally mounted butt rib closeouts, butt ribs. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of stuff. I'm working on wiring right now. I found some cool new, you know, solder sleeves, um, different pedo routing. You know, there's all sorts of really cool stuff that I've uh, worked on in the last couple weeks. But uh, this video is mostly gonna focus on cowlings and then I'll just touch on some of the other stuff that I worked on. So without further ado, here we go. Okay, so this is the uh, Kit Fox Model 7 cowling that Kit Fox has been making for years. It's an old mold. They've been, you know, as I said, doing it for a long time. You see it on a lot of planes. And I just figured, you know, no, no need to reinvent the wheel. We can just go with the Kit Fox cowlings and call it good. It's, I think it was originally designed around the Rotax 912 uh, ULS or maybe UL, but uh, I think it works with the 915 and a lot of other um, versions that, uh, engines that people are putting in here. Right off the bat, um, there were some issues that I had with this cowling. Um, the instructions aren't horrible. I mean, I've seen worse, but uh, it's kind of hard to write instructions for this process. I think that, um, you know, a video would have been helpful to actually walk you through the process, and I wish I'd documented it a bit better, but I had no idea what I was doing, so there's no way I could have documented it. I'm like, oh yeah, this is the right thing to do. Um, I still don't even know what the right thing to do was, and honestly, I'm happy with the way it turned out, but if I had to do it again, there would be a lot of things that I would have done differently. So, um, yeah, it took a really long time, probably three days. Um, to get it, maybe even more than that, to get it fit together. And there's still a lot of body work that's gonna have to be done. Uh, there's been rumors that the molds are pretty bad uh, because they're old. They've gotten a lot of, seen a lot of use. I would agree that there are some flaws in this mold, particularly in the nose section where it's most complex, where you'd have problems with the mold. Like, so these like little nose scoops and like the spacing on these front, um, I don't know what you call this, just like the front fascia of the cowling. They were, you know, they're not lined up with each other really, and uh, it's just going to take a lot of diddling around with like bondo and high saw and stuff to make it make it clean. Um, when you pull fiberglass out, um, of if you just if, when they ship you fiberglass, there's always lines from the mold. So that was where they I don't know if they intentionally put them in. Um, sometimes it's where they taped off marks or the edge of the previous. Um, surface was when they were making the mold that typically indicates about where you'd want to cut the fiberglass for your shape because you know you, like my my cowling is not really going to deviate much from any other model 7 cowling that anybody else puts on so the lines on there should be pretty good they're not um and i made that mistake early on up here you just can't trust the lines on these cowlings um, they're it's, it's uh, sort of an artistic process getting it on there and uh, you just have to be very patient and be iterative about it and go over and over and over again to get the, uh, get the right shape at the end of the process. It takes a really long time, a lot of patience, um, but it's definitely not you know cut to the line and call it good. I feel like they could do that and it would still be successful. Um, I'm not 100% certain about like molding and making fiberglass stuff, but I feel like there's a way of making it to where the lines are at least closer than what they are, um, or maybe like a little bit long. It could be nice if the lines got you close, uh, but they don't. So definitely a lot of 
sort of shock there, um, particularly in the nose section, where uh, you know they're they're not quite what what you want them to be. So, uh, I mean, the instructions walk you through this process. What I did first was I trimmed up the nose and the sides, and I should have trimmed the side. I should have left the shot sides a little bit longer than I actually did, because my biggest sort of goof up was not having enough material down at the edge of the cowling here, and I can show you. I followed a little beyond where the line was, so the line is like right, right about a centimeter up, so I left the line on there and then a little bit of extra material, and it ended up being a little short of what I needed to wrap all the way around the edge. Um, I actually had to get these together on the ground to work with them to get the nose correct, and um, I had to commit to something, so I committed to that line, and I should have left, you know, what is that, half inch? Should have left half inch of material and it would have been a much cleaner seam. What I'm gonna do to fix this is tape everything off and just lay either Bondo or high saw or something in that groove and sand it out so that this termination right there is at the edge where it's supposed to be. And um, the little flap on the back where this extends up definitely has enough coverage up there to get a cam lock. So I'm not worried about that. It was just would have looked nicer if I close it off, but you know, all of that can be fixed with Bondo work. So basically the moral of this story was if I had left this a little longer, I wouldn't be dealing with that. Same is true on the other side, a um, little gap there, not as big as the other side, but uh, that's because I cut this top section to the line or a little beyond the line and it just wasn't enough to meet the gap. So you have to leave that long. And it does say that in the instructions, like don't cut to the line, or I don't even know if it said don't cut to the line, but it said don't. Um, cut these until the very end, but it's it's like a chicken and egg thing. So you kind of have to cut them eventually to get it to fit. Um, but um, yeah, I, I feel like you can do the nose cone last because if you get this piece on, then you completely fit the nose cone however you want it later on because this is completely independent of the top piece. I did this a while ago, so I can't 100% remember exactly the order of operations of how things were finished here, but um, one thing I forgot to mention is this boot cow has to go on prior to everything else going on. And uh, this is something that the boot cow and the firewall are things that I wish that I had a long time ago from the beginning of the build because there's a lot of things like this angle down here, this fabric attach angle and the firewall terminations and all that stuff um, that would have been, it would have been nice to plan around having this here because now that you know this is all covered and stuff, I can't really body work this to fit the fabric angle. It's a pretty good match. I'm not gonna complain about it or anything, but you know, it just still would have been nice to have this and the firewall early on. So I had thought about that. The manual calls for this part early on where you're doing uh, this angle, but um, you know, it was like months before I got cowlings. Mounted the boot cowl with nut plates. You can see them over there, I'll zoom all the way in. They're just uh, nut plates all the way up the side and screws. Typically it's done with rivets. And then the boot cowl is permanently riveted in those spots there along the side and then on the front edge. But that means you can't remove it, which would be a real pain because you can't get in here or anything anymore. Um, I mean, I guess you can, but I think having a removable boot cowl is going to be, you know, a godsend. And they say it's an option, but uh, I don't think it's really optional. It should be something that you, that you do if you're doing it. So that's what I did. Um, so anyways, I used nut plates along the side there and then the boot cowl is attached, gets to the firewall here with cam locks that I'm just using number 30 Clecos to hold them in place. And we'll do the clamp cam locks later on. There's that gap also that I'm gonna fill in. It was a really rough, I mean, you can see the edge of these molds are pretty chunky. So um, I'm gonna come through and smooth all this stuff out so we have nice clean lines. So yeah, with the boot cowl mounted, you can get this in place. And um, I, should, I guess I should say, this is actually really complicated because you have a lot of parts that you're trying to line up in one go. Primarily, the prop spacing is super important. This cowling is pretty much de facto designed for a two inch prop spacer. I called Deborah McBean at the factory and asked if I needed a prop spacer and she's like, well, I don't know, it depends on what prop you're using. And um, I did some research and it really doesn't depend on what prop you're using. I mean, so yeah, unless you're running some, I don't know, crazy propeller. I've got a Luga, even the Dukes, everything, pretty much every standard propeller with these cowlings, the way that it's spaced off the nose, they're going to need a two inch prop spacer. This is 45 centimeters, which is just shy of two inches. Um, we just made some wooden block spacers to hold it in place because I don't have a prop spacer yet. 
but I will be getting one soon. Um, that, that was just sort of for us to mock it up uh, to get that approximate two inch spacing so we could get this nose thing flushed up. So that has to be, they, they say in the manual that it's like optional to have your prop and spinner on. Spinner I could consider optional. I mean, it would be nice, it would have been nice to have the spinner on because we would have been able to get it perfectly true. Um, but prop spacer is not an option. I mean, you, you pretty much have to 100% get something on there so that you can line up the four aft spacing of the whole cowling. So that, that's what I did. And we, we, again, we didn't have a prop spacer, so we used this, this cool little wooden block that my uncle built, put together for me. So another thing that you're fighting, and I guess I'm gonna have to pull this apart, show this. Okay, now that I have that off, you can see our mock-up two inch prop spacer. It's a little longer than two inches. And then another thing that you're fighting <coughs> is the radiator. So that radiator has to be not only correctly spaced for the NACA duct, but also correctly spaced from the bottom of the cowling. You go in side there, you can see that it's got a small gap underneath there. It doesn't really say exactly how far it has to be at the bottom. I'm not 100% positive, but uh, it definitely does have to be, you can't be touching the cowling. So the radiator basically has an up-down position, and then a uh, it's like a tilt function, it's a pitch function forward and aft that's dependent on that NACA duct. And you basically can't really mount that radiator until you at least have the cowling in so you can figure out your height. And then also that somewhat sets your pitch. And then once you get the um, radiator mounted, you're constrained by the NACA duct. So in order to get this thing fit, you're chasing um, a lot of different parts. and I know this looks really solid now, it actually is. When you don't have Clecos in here, this thing's wobbling all over the place. You got one edge coming up really high. There's no way to really, you can't really tape it in place. There's nothing that's strong enough to hold it while you work on it. I mean, there could be some trick that I don't know about, uh, but until you get Clecos in there, it's, it's, uh, it's just wobble city. You just gotta have to wobble all over the place. So yeah, thinking about how I would do this again if I had to, I would just focus on this bottom cowl first and get it locked in place. As soon as you get these Clecos in, you're in the money. Um, it locks everything in place. This becomes very rigid and solid, and it becomes like a foundation for you to work on for everything else. And then once you get this locked in place, everything else can be set and shifted accordingly to fit to uh, this shape, basically. The back edge always has had to be trimmed, and that is dependent on not only like the actual, so like, I don't even know how to explain this. This is so abstract and wonky, but, um, it had to be fit sideways um, around this shape. And depending on how far forward and backwards you moved it, basically depends on how that, that profile wraps. So in theory, there's like an optimal position. This one is what we picked and it works. I mean, it probably is optimal position between like four inches, but there is like a, a zone that it's really happy. And the zone that it's most happy is when this is, you know, protruding from the um, actual front plate of the engine about an inch and a half. And that's why you need that prop spacer up there because um, you have to pull this forward and there's no way of knowing how far, how, far, how far forward you need to go unless you actually have like a prop mount and then a prop spacer spacing that mount. So again, super crazy screwing this around, uh, but um, we eventually got this in place. And once we got this in place, we got the height of the radiator set and um, we're gonna talk about the radiator, but while this is on, I guess, because I don't wanna put it back on again, um, I can talk about the NACA duct that's underneath there. So right off the bat, I don't know if you can see this, but the NACA duct's a little bit crooked. Um, I don't think it's anything anybody's gonna notice, but it is, it is uh, hard to find. You know, I think all this fiberglass works since it was done probably hand foamed. I don't think it was CNC'd or anything. Um, there are like some minor impurities like that is slightly crooked and that's slightly crooked and all that stuff. Um, so if you're, I had to tell my uncle, stop trying to make it perfect because it's not possible. Whatever we pick will be what we pick. And it's just, he was had measurement tools out and all that stuff and like trying to measure like, oh, what's the spacing between there and there versus there and there. And it'll completely drive you nuts if you get a measuring tape. So I just made him put his measuring tape away and we just eyeballed it because this is, this is at the end of the day, this is an aesthetic part of the plane and uh, getting a measuring tape out is just foolish and will we'll, uh, drive you mad. So like that, for example, is one of the things, this NACA duct, there were lines on here. I don't know if you can see them, 
but from their mold, that's where they had their NAC ducts, which was even further back than we have it. And that's probably because I've got an oil cooler that had been constrained to this, but um, probably a million ways to skin a cat. This one's further forward. Maybe there's some airflow modeling that they mounted it further back for, I don't know. But uh, that was a sort of, a, it's another one of the warnings. It's like, don't follow their lines, just do what makes sense for you. And if it deviates from their lines a little bit, it's probably fine. So as I said, there are a lot of moving parts in here. The, probably the biggest question that I had to deal with was this radiator mounting. And uh, it took a lot of trial and error to figure out exactly which way it was supposed to go. Um, they give you these tabs um, of stainless that you're supposed to, it's just like a big sheet uh, or like bar of stainless that you have to cut and bend and mount to the side of the radiator. And uh, they tell you to cut the whole thing, I think, to nine inches. They give you an approximate length. And then they say, don't cut it any shorter because you have to make it fit with your cowlings. So I had them long for a while. And uh, that was one of the things that we're struggling with because basically you couldn't get the cowlings on while this was there because this was too long. And I didn't want to know, I didn't know exactly how high to make this until I had the cowlings on. So you can see it's ch chicken and egg argument where you can't, I had to basically just pull this whole thing out mount the cowling, then put this whole thing back in and try and measure exactly how high it was from the bottom of the cowling and uh, then space it accordingly. These ended up being seven inches long, uh, basically from the top of the, um, the top of the metal strap to this top bolt in the radiator. So seven inches from top bolt to the next bolt down. The whole thing, I don't know how long the whole thing is, I'm not gonna measure it, but that's, that's what we ended up settling with at the end of the day, and it works out pretty well. Probably could be a little bit longer, but uh, that's, that's what we chose, and it seemed to be working well with us. Um, once you get that hole drilled at the top, that helps from keeping these to wiggle around, because we were holding them in with um, just like little pony clamps, but uh, that's not really sufficient to keep the pitch forward, because this, I guess I could have raised the tail up. That would have been helpful. We did that a few times. It's easier to work on this, but there's, a, in theory, a plane with this part of the engine mount right here that's straight up and down. And we wanted to try and match, match that as much as possible so this in level flight isn't pitching back um, with the plane. It's gonna be straight up and down into the airstream. I, I don't think that's really gonna affect things as much because the NACA doesn't really care about, I mean, the, the shape of the NACA on the front um, is not, it is dependent on angle of attack, but you know, it's gonna feed air into it you know, regardless of how, if this is off by five degrees. So the end, of, the end result that we ended up with um, in terms of pitching it forward was constrained by that NACA duct. So the bottom of this NACA duct right here, these are the slots that we cut for the oil cooler. If we wanted to pitch that oil cooler radiator further forward, this NACA duct, we basically would have had to cut like all the way back to here. And um, that was an option, but we just figured that, you know, it, it wouldn't at that point, this wouldn't be tall enough to cover the whole radiator. It's like the height of the radiator is basically the same distance from here to the bottom of the um, cowling. So if you cut it short, you're basically only feeding air. You're not, bas you're not, you're feeding air not 100% of the radiator face. You'll be cutting short. And I guess you could address that somehow by like putting rubber padding around it. I've seen pictures of that on people's radiators, but I mean, this stuff is, I, I don't really know the best option there. I just figured it'd be better to have, you know, your full radiator face exposed to the surface of the wind rather than having a slight, like a slot of air flowing at that radiator and oil cooler. So that basically forced us into the, it's like about five degrees pitched back position to fit this NACA duct. And what we did to fit the NACA duct was um, we pulled the fittings out of the oil cooler. And that meant that this wasn't a problem. We didn't have to cut these slots so it would fit right over. And then drilled some number 40 holes in where we thought it would be good. Like we lined it up there, drilled some, marked it with a pencil, drilled some number 40 holes, just one on each side and that hauled it in place. And we were able to mock it up and we ended up moving it, um, I don't know if it was forward or back, a few inches at the end of the, at the, end of the whole process um, by just drilling new number 40 holes. <sighs> Actually, before we glued it, it was cleat coat in place and we cut the profile out according to the dimensions in the manual and then uh, got it nice and smoothed out, the profile nice and smoothed out so that it matched the shape of the NACA. And then, uh, then we glued it in place with a reinforced doubler behind this section. So this is super bulletproof and strong. 
But once we got this basically set up and constrained in space, we finally mounted the little strap that comes down from the bottom of the radiator and mounts back to the uh, engine mount on the back. So a lot to chase around is the moral here. Like uh, we spent probably three days working on these and they still need some more body work and just sort of touch ups here and there that I'm not really gonna get to until much later. Um, I wanna basically get my cam locks in and permanently mounted before I do my final body work because where those cam locks settle might change how some of those lines are. And uh, I'd rather have the lines correct with the final cam lock mounting. Um, so for now, this is gonna work out. I'm still holding off on the exhaust that typically comes out of the bottom of the cowling, just straight down like this, pretty much. You have to, we were thinking about doing some elaborate thing out the side and all sorts of weird stuff, but it has to be either straight down or straight back because you have to be able to remove the cowling from the bottom. And if you do something out of the side, I, mean, I guess you could like peel it off, but it would just be challenging and likely to cause some problems. So this would be quieter, I think, straight down because it's gonna be further away from the pilot seat. But we're primarily thinking about pitching this back to come out of the bottom of the cowling at the bottom right there. And uh, it'll be noisier, but still trying to figure this one out. Definitely is gonna need some welding. Like uh, I'm gonna need to take this to a muffler shop and have them move the spring either way uh, because it's not properly set up for this cowling. This is just like the stock Rotax um, exhaust that comes with the 912 IS. So um, that's all I gotta say about the cowlings. I think there's some more stuff to work with along, along the way down the road, but for now, that's all, all I really have to say. It's hard. Um, the main takeaway is that it's, it's hard. It requires a lot of patience. It's not an exact process. And there's basically, unless you're, you're an expert, I don't think there's any way of avoiding doing sort of excessive amounts of body work down the line to touch up the cowling. I mean, I guess you could always leave it. That's fine. Um, but if you want it to look really nice, there's a lot of, there's a lot of body work and little stuff that uh, is going to have to be chased out along the way. So, and we did a pretty good job. You know, I'm not, I'm not really uh, upset about how it turned out. I mean, it was definitely hard, took a lot of work, but at the end of the day, it's a pretty darn good cowling job. And uh, with a little bit of body work, it's gonna look super pro and uh, you know, sh should have a great set of cowlings for many years. There is one thing I can bring up, um, Lauren up in um, Alaska, he's putting, uh, well, he's putting an O200, I think, in his plane, which is in itself a whole different animal. But he's doing the classic Piper bump cowl or button cowl or whatever they call it on the front, bowl cowl. That's just a front nose plate um, with the little cutouts. And then basically like a piece of fiberglass or carbon fiber or aluminum that wraps around the sides. It says it's a super easy process. I'm really interested to see how that comes out because uh, that not only will have a very different look for the Kit Fox, but it will also could potentially dramatically solve this whole saga of uh, cowlings because you know it takes forever to get these things and if when you do get them it's an immense amount of work to get them um, fit to your aircraft and that that could be sort of a a quicker and uh, sort of less labor intensive process um, for for solving the whole cowling issue but I'm, I'm watching out so Lauren keep it up <laughs> we're ready to see what you got in store okay enough about cowlings what else is functional? Bam. Right, so the panel, it's in. Not all this stuff's tightened. It says not to tighten it until the very end. Um, I don't know when the very end is, but uh, these bolts are mostly held in place and pretty much all the connectors are terminated uh, and in, in their proper locations with the exception of a few ends that I got to chase down for like trim uh, and I mean there's actually quite a few parts that have to be chased down and plugged in but all the the main guts of the whole panel kit are in. <clears throat> Something that's really amazing is the first time I plugged in that backup battery and flipped the switch it turned on and the first time I hooked it up to the master and flipped the switch everything else turned on so out of the box everything powered up and as as I've heard uh, there was no white smoke um, I do have one short that I'm chasing around that's in my tail light wiring that uh, has to do with something to do with like the 
I think it's the ground on the shielding that um, I just, I soldered it myself. I didn't do a very good job. And I realized that there's these things called uh, like solder, solder terminals that you can get from Stein Air that you hit with a heat gun and it pulls down with solder on the shielded wire. So I'm gonna chop those and redo my work on the back of the, like the rudder light and see if that solves the problem. It might, and if it does, uh, that'll be a total uh, salvation. Otherwise there might be some short in here, who knows. Um, a weird, weird thing that happened is I, I ordered this without the cabin air vents. I didn't want these eyeball vents because I was doing the like door, the Brian Bush door handles. And it came with holes for the air vents. So I was like, well, crap, now I've got holes in there. And I'm either gonna have to plug them with something or put some other instrument in. And I just sort of bit the bullet and bought these uh, eyeball vents. They just came in like yesterday. Um, I can put the part number up. It's, it's a weird size. Not all of them, will, there aren't really many options that will work for this panel because of the way they've been cut. But I definitely, I found one that fits beautifully. This one works great. So I just pop those in. They had a black option that I said, oh no, I don't want those because I'd rather have this finished aluminum. Now that I look at the contrast, the aluminum against the panel, I kind of wish I'd chose the black, but um, they're still really sweet looking eyeball vents and they uh, are smooth to operate and really well made. So I'll live with the silver ones. That being said, um, I have to basically kit out the entire cabin air vent kit which is really not hard. Basically the only things involved in that kit are eyeball vents of the appropriate size that fit, the right size NACA duck. I bought these really cool carbon fiber ones, uh, mostly because there are a lot of complaints about the other poly ones that they break down. And I just know that this is gonna hold up for a while and I don't wanna have cracking NACA ducks. Probably would've been okay with the poly ones, but or just like an auto one, but this one I'm certain is gonna hold up. And they're, you know, hundred bucks a piece. So no cheap, no cheaping out, but that's kind of why I like, I like I would prefer to buy out these kits myself rather than buying them from Kitfox because when you buy them from Kitfox, um, you don't really have control over what quality of parts they use. And I feel like to make it affordable sometimes, um, you get kind of a loss in product quality. And that's cool for a lot of people, if, especially if you're trying, like on a tight budget or um, just trying to get something that does, does well without you know, spending too much money. But you know, an example would be like those pitot tubes. It would have been nice to have color-coded pitot tubes for the pitot and AOA. And that costs, you know, like it comes at a slight cost premium, but I'm willing to pay that premium for the convenience and the quality that you get by having color coded pedo. Same thing with like the snack duct and these eyeball vents. Like I didn't buy the Kit Fox kit, but I know I buy these, some scat tube and this eyeball vent, and I've got my own cabin heater kit or not cabin heater kit, but cabin air kit. It adds weight and all that jazz, but wasn't, wasn't too hard to piece all the parts together. So, um, I, again, sort of a weird thing. I, again, I didn't ask for the eyeball vents, but I got them cut. So, I mean, maybe there is some other solution of just like plugging it that would have been cheaper and lighter, but I figured, you know, I got the holes there. I can chase down the parts. So there's a lot of hangups and issues I had with mounting things for this panel. Um, there's like constraints, space constraints that, um, you don't, I mean, I didn't really think about until I realized like, oh crap, I gotta fit a heater in there at some point in time. So I had to wiggle things around. Um, just like an update on the, on the hoses. I'm currently working with a guy out of Wisconsin who's super helpful that's helping me put together a full on hose kit, firewall back and firewall forward. So we'll have a full, you know, super high quality hose run from basically the header tank all the way up to the engine and back. Um, they're doing, we're doing nice PTFE line braided stainless runs for the aft section, um, some sort of customized fuel um, shutoff valve adjustments that make it easier to route through the cabling. We're doing uh, uh, like special tube bends for the um, fuel manifold, all sorts of cool stuff that um, th this guy in named Steve is at Aircraft Specialty is helping me put together. So at the end of this, we'll have uh, not only a firewall aft kit put together, but also a firewall forward kit that'll have, you know, full integral fire, fire sleeve, pressure, t pressure tested hoses and um, tubing. So I'm super excited about that. I put a hold on this and I already did spend like 400 bucks on these JEGS lines, um, but I just have to cut bait. And I know that sucks because it's like 400 bucks down the road and I still don't have exactly what I'm looking for, but I want to do it right. Like I don't want to have cheap fuel equipment. I want to have really, really good solid fuel, fuel lines and routing. And I can do it myself 
a lot of you might laugh and like, why would you spend that much money on fuel hoses and stuff like that when you could have just done it yourself? Sure, you're not wrong. You go look inside of a Piper Cub and they're just like <laughs> so janky. Some of them are just so poorly run and, and whatnot. But you know, if I'm gonna skimp on anything, I'm not skimping on the fuel system. And sure, I could save like 500 bucks or something like that. But in the grand scheme of things, it's a very small portion of the total cost of the airplane. And I think it's well worth the investment. So that's gonna take a couple weeks probably to get that ironed out. And we'll have all of our hoses put together and the lengths and stuff that you can get from Steve in Wisconsin if that's something that interests you. Stein Air has become my new favorite aviation supply store. It's a Stein Brooch. He's somewhere in Wisconsin also, I think. He sells all sorts of cool stuff like this. These are push to connect for pitos. You just sort of plug them in and they plug together. He, sold, he sells this color-coded um, pito and AOA plumbing. You can also get static. So I have this color-coded all the way up to the front. He also sell these, sells these little terminations that don't come with the panel that you have to find, which uh, plug right into the back of the, I don't know, Adahars unit or whatever that is. Um, he also sells a bunch of electrical stuff, like these little terminals, these solder terminals, that are connectors that I didn't have that I'm going to go buy. But uh, he's got all sorts of really sweet stuff um, on his website that will make the whole electrical and avionics process much easier. He is an avionics specialist. I do have all of my uh, braided stainless brake lines run, at least to the parking brake, which is right there. And I'm still working around how I'm gonna get it coming back from there all the way through. I'm gonna go through this corner, through that double layer of fabric, and then run it down this front leg to the brake, uh, uh, what do you call that, not pistons. Yeah, I guess they're pistons. So a lot of, I saw Brian's and some other kit boxes at Sun and Fun, they have their brake lines run on this back, this back gear leg. I wanna run it on the front for a couple of reasons. One, if it's back here, somebody can kick it and it can get in the way. If you put it on the inside, still somebody can step there and kick it. So it's exposed to being kicked. If you put it up here, particularly on the back side of this, uh, like on that corner, it can't really get kicked and um, you can't really approach it from the front side. So I feel like it's sort of more guarded up in this area. Um, and it's also a shorter run of brake line. So I'm gonna choose this as my brake line leg, but uh, you know, I haven't got there yet. So we'll figure that out when we get there. Other than that, like you can see all this avionics stuff that's run, really beautiful job that Nick did. And he's been super helpful. Like ever, if I ever have problems, I can send him a message uh, and he's always there to help troubleshoot and figure out any issues that I might have. So still the greatest thing I've ever bought, probably ever. And it's definitely the greatest thing I've ever bought and uh, purchased from Kit Fox. All right, I know this video is probably gonna take forever. So uh, I might even split it up into two. So if this is in a second video, welcome. Another thing that we figured out, my uncle and I figured out while we were trying to mount flaperons. I, I wanted to get everything done that required two people um, while he was here. Flaperons are one of those things. They're super delicate, uh, they're awkward, cumbersome, sharp, all sorts of problems with them. Um, and I, I had mounted them before when I did drill these holes into the ribs and I had a problem. And I guess I can zoom into what exactly I had the problem with and show I guess my solution to what I did with that problem. So I'll start by saying I have no clue. Actually, this is a better one to look at. Bam. So I'll start by saying I have no clue what these things are made of, probably stainless, but they're really, 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 really hard. I mean like super hard, hard to drill through, hard to bend, just a really, really hard part. And I think because of that, the build quality on them had some, had some problems and forced me to, to make a decision that I'm, I ended up, I'm really glad that I did because it was really a struggle in the long run. The way that these were bent, um, there's like a left and a right part. I guess I can zoom all the way in. You can see how that terminates differently than this one. And this one's narrower than that one. Um, so they were put in a break and they weren't perfectly lined up. This hole on the right side was not match drilled with the one on the left. It was match drilled there. So you can see that the right side, as it sits on a flat surface, the right side is slightly higher up than the left side. So this left side protrudes down. So because of that, the holes were shifted off from each other just a tiny bit. I mean, you can obviously see that would cause a problem because when you try and put a bolt through there, it's gonna have to go through crooked because this one is lower than that one. So either go through that way 
order come up and you go through that way. I always went through that way. That made it even more complicated because you have a whole, the flapper on hinge bracket, which goes, or the flapper on hinge, which goes in between these, that provides another hole that it has to go through. So you slide that up in there and you're trying to basically get a hole, a bolt, all the way diagonal through three pieces of the hardest metal I've ever dealt with in my life. So getting the flap rods on and off was a huge pain and it was putting like, because it was putting side load on it, basically these were all sitting crooked because you know, one's higher than the other. It's, it, once you tighten it, it wants to basically tip the whole thing sideways. And that was putting side load on the actual bearing that the hinge was on. So the flap rods were binding a little bit. So it was a big, it was a big uh, issue to sort of chase down not all of them were this bad. I mean, this is the, probably the worst one on the plane. You can see how obviously like, wonky it is. Um, we tried to straighten them out as much as possible on the ground, but you're, you're, at the end of the day, you were constrained by the fact that this bend along the side here was put slightly lower down on the metal. So that means it's gonna, this is gonna sit a little bit higher because there's more metal on the upper side of the bend. And this one's gonna sit a little bit lower because there's more metal on the lower side of the bend, which hence, this is wider than that one. So more metal, um, you know, it's just, they just weren't bent exactly the same. So I was stressing about what the heck am I gonna do about that? What I ended up doing was I tried the reamer and the reamer was useless because it just could, one, I had an, uh, uh, I guess I had a 0.375 or 316th reamer that's exactly the size of the bolt. And as I previously mentioned in another video, the AN-3 uh, hardware is, slightly larger than 3 16 or can be slightly larger than 3 16 It goes up to a number 20. Um, so already it's hard to get the bolt all the way through there. So what I did was I oversized it to the next drill size up, which don't quote me on this, but I think is 11 64 whatever the next size up in 64 from 3 16 is, and just drilled that hole out to be big. Um, and I just did it in the brackets, not the actual hinge that's on the flapper on, just all the way through the brackets. So what that did, sure, okay, it's gonna introduce a little bit of play in the system because you can, in theory, your bolts can wiggle like this up and down. But um, this wasn't perfectly CNC machined. So you can't expect to have a perfect fit to you know, a, a thousandth of an inch, whatever, whatever the tolerances are when you machine, so, or a few thousandths of an inch. So thinking that the, these, these holes weren't already lined up, so you had to oversize them. There was no option. I mean, unless you built all new parts and had them line up from the beginning, your only real option is to oversize the holes. And um, that's what we did. And I cannot tell you how much easier it is to put the flaperons on. Not only that, but they don't bind anymore. So um, the flaperons go on straight. First time you can get the bolts in. There actually is almost no play, particularly because that middle hole in the actual hinge bracket, that middle hole isn't, um, I, we, didn't, we didn't ream that hole out larger than 3 16 so the bolt goes in it snugs up with that one and yes in theory it can play up and down a tiny bit but once you tighten those down it's a non-issue it's a complete non-issue and the fact that there's you know five of these on each wing um it's just this is way over engineered super strong and i don't see another way around reaming out those holes to a, a 64th larger than they're supposed to be it's just the nature of how these things were built on a break um there's no way around it i mean as far as i know I mean, maybe somebody can come up with a solution and there's probably some sneaky kit boxer out there that knows, knows the trick to this, but uh, that's what we did. So stressful, definitely stressful uh, time every time I put the flapperons back on. Um, I guess while I'm here, these rivets that went in on the flapperon hinge brackets, you can't really get the rivet gun all the way up against there. So some of my rivets aren't perfectly flush on the top. I went and tapped some of them down with a hammer. Um, but the uh, rivet gun has to be basically filed down on the sides like it was for the bracket. There's a, there's a rivet that goes in one of these brackets that you can't fit a rivet gun in, so you have to basically grind the whole sides down. So the same thing is true for, for these brackets as well. That's it for this one. Sorry, this video probably ran a little bit long. I'm putting some clips from Sun and Fun up here. I had a great time. Got to meet Steve Henry, saw a bunch of cool planes. It was all in all a fantastic experience. Um, definitely going to go again next year. Still got a lot of, lot of uh, updates to catch up on, like butt ribs and some other things that I've gotten done. So I'll have another video out soon, but thanks for watching.